Now for more on Trump and his first foreign trip, I'm joined by Rob Moran. He's a partner at Brunswick Group, an advisory firm specializing in corporate relations. Welcome, Rob. Well, thank you. Now, Donald Trump's first overseas trip comes amid a range of controversy at home. We have um, questions over Russian interference in the U.S. election, whether he tried to head off an FBI investigation. Mm -hmm. And then just late Friday, we see that James Comey, the FBI director he fired, is going to be testifying in open session in front of the Senate. How likely is all this drama at home going to overshadow his foreign policy aspirations? Good question. I mean... The fact is foreign leaders follow domestic U.S. politics very closely for clues as to how to operate with the current U.S. president. His approval rating in the United States is 39.7 percent as of this morning, and they look at that and evaluate his strength or weakness and what they think they can negotiate with him on. He is coming onto the world stage in a somewhat weakened position relative to other presidents at his stage in office. Many presidents who have taken the foreign stage, usually earlier, have much higher approval ratings when they go abroad. So you, so you think this may weaken his uh, negotiation stance then, perhaps, in these upcoming meetings? I think he has some interesting challenges. So if you look at global public opinion around the world, over 60% of the voters in the, U in the UK, in France, and Germany believe he's more dangerous. He makes the world more dangerous. Uh, only 15% of voters in Germany believe he's competent. His negatives unfavorable in France are 81%. That makes other world leaders less likely to want to cut favorable deals for him. Uh, and it challenges, it, it's a challenge, I think, for, for this president. Now let's start with his first stop, which is, which is Saudi Arabia. How significant is it, do you think, that President Trump is starting his first overseas trip as president in Saudi Arabia? I think it's very significant. Mo since Reagan, since President Reagan, U.S. presidents have traveled first to their hemispheric partners, first to Canada and Mexico, in part to highlight the importance of those trading partners, but also as a road test for the rest of their foreign travel, which needs to be choreographed. This president didn't do that. He's going right to Saudi Arabia, which is interesting. I do think it's geopolitically important. We have a number of allies in the Middle East. This is reassuring them. The subtext here, uh, as your program has noted, is Iran. Uh, and I think that will be quite a bit under uh, discussion. And in terms of business deals then, what does each side want to get out of this visit? My view is that the security issues are overwhelmingly more important than the, the business relationship. Um, some of our allies in the Middle East have had open questions in the past about our commitment uh, and the concerns about how we're operating relative to Iran. And I think that that is this, the large subtext uh, of this meeting. But I think it's important to think about when, when you think about a president's foreign travel, you need, to think about, you need to view it through two different lenses, and I believe most countries do. There's the diplomatic lens, what is America trying to do on the international stage, and then there's the, the domestic lens. How, how does that international travel support the president's domestic standing? Now, we know that obviously this issue of terror was a huge campaign that he ran on. Um, and he's expected, according to his officials, to make an inspiring yet direct speech on confronting radical ideology. How do you think that's going to be received? Well, let me just put it this way. Um, when, a, when a president travels abroad, uh, these events are try. You know, people attempt to choreograph and script these events. Um, I think the president has chosen a difficult early area to uh, stake a claim to, and I think that's a very different, difficult communications environment. Um, international travel for presidents can be gaff prone on occasion, and I think this could be a rough spot. It's. I think there's a tight balancing act most presidents have to walk when it comes to the Middle East. Right. And we'll see if he can walk that balancing act. And speaking of tough spots, you gave us some of the statistics about how he might potentially be received in Europe. Um, we know that he'll be meeting with European leaders at NATO in Brussels and then the G7 he'll go on to in Italy. They've expressed concerns over Trump's America, America first policy, his kind of push away from globalization. What are your expectations for those talks? Well, it's interesting. Um, the challenge, I think, for the Trump administration and also the challenge for NATO leaders is that the president has made very different remarks about NATO over the last year and a half, uh, questioning its usefulness and then supporting it. His advisors have made sort of tried to attempt to fix some of those statements. Uh, and I think it's all played out in the press as far as their concerns about his support for what is actually a foundational alliance for the United States. 
Americans favor, have a favorable impression of NATO by a 53 to 25% margin, so basically a two to one margin. Um, so they do actually view it, view it as a foundational alliance. Um, we, we've conducted research all over the world, 25 different countries in the last year, and there is a tension between uh, interdependence of nations and independence of nations. Right. And I think the president is, 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 is going to have to navigate that, and he won an election talking more about independence, but NATO and the G7 are about interdependence. We'll certainly have to see which line he toes when he actually gets to Brussels. Thank you so much, Rob Moran, partner at the Brunswick Group here in Washington, D.C.